ripped right around the back of me and shot right for those things. But then it disappeared on him, and it was just gone. The military says the lights over Arizona last night were flares, but the people who saw the lights last night say they couldn't have been flares. In central Phoenix, in what is known as the Sunny Slope area, the Lay family were coming home in the early evening to watch for the Hale-Bopp comet when they witnessed a very large craft fly directly over their house. You know, because when the craft went over, I really focused on the light. The tip was right out in the street, and the arm is going by, and the end of the arm was at least to that mountain over there. It was six, seven hundred feet away with these huge lights set inside of it. And I look inside, and it's like... It's wavy. When you when you look down the street on a hot day in Phoenix, uh -huh. above the streets like it's really wavy, and you see everything kind of distorted. Uh -huh. And that's what it looked like up inside the middle of the craft. And it just skimmed by. Didn't even make a sound. Not even a sound. Further eyewitness testimony came from Stacy Rhodes and her daughter Emily, who both saw a giant craft fly over their car. It was gunmetal black. It wasn't shiny. It wasn't invisible it was more of a dull bluish black color and we both just stayed there and looked at it for a couple minutes and it was completely silent mike fortson spotted the same craft from his backyard in chandler a suburb of phoenix when you're looking to the north towards phoenix proper the the lights of the city of phoenix and tempe and scottsdale and all these here will form a gray background and this was a black object coming through a gray background we had no problem whatsoever seeing this vehicle we knew it wasn't really ours because it was just too doggone big. Matter of fact, uh, profoundly massive is a better way to describe it. We don't really have words in our language to describe something that large. It was huge. Councilwoman Frances Barwood was approached by a reporter who complained about the lack of response from local government regarding the sightings. What this reporter said was that they had gone to every level of government, including the city of Phoenix, and nobody would talk to them that this object went from north of Prescott and called in all the way down to Tucson and then was also seen in Wickenburg and uh, nobody would give them any answer. They either told them that they were not going to talk about it at all or that um, there was nothing, that nothing happened. Responding to mounting pressure from his constituents, Governor Fife Symington held a press conference. Oh, I'm going to order a uh, full you know, investigation of this through DPS. We're going to make all the necessary inquiries, and we're going to get to the bottom of it. We're going to find out if it was a UFO. Later that day, Governor Symington held an unscheduled live press conference to announce that they had discovered the source behind the Phoenix lights. And now I'll ask Officer Stein and his colleagues to escort the accused into the room so that we may all look upon the guilty party. And this just goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. Well, I think everybody pretty much laughed at it. I thought it was really disgusting. He was just dismissing everything that these people had seen and said, just like we're all Looney Tunes. I, I just thought that was a really improper attitude for somebody in his position. Nobody in state, local, federal, military, nobody wanted to talk about it. Um, they didn't want to interview witnesses. They said it didn't happen. They said it didn't concern them. Uh, there was one councilwoman, Frances Barwood. She's the one that, that spoke up and said, why don't we investigate? And then when it came time for her election, she lost. And, and the, the press, the media, everybody else was really trashing her bad. Why is everybody so afraid? And the only thing I can think of is, one, they're afraid of their careers, which you know, it comes to a point of what's more important, your soul or your job, and I guess to them it's their job. And the second thing is the scorn factor. The U.S. military's involvement in the UFO subject dates back to World War II. It began with the sighting by Air Force pilots of mysterious luminous orbs called Foo Fighters, which would pace aircraft during missions and then dart away. They fly circles around anything we've got flying. That strange behavior includes the ability to both hover and move at extremely high velocity, to make right angle turns at high speed, to go straight up, straight down, all of this typically without any noise, without any visible external engines, without any wings, without any tail. We simply could not do that back 50 years ago. In the summer of 1947, numerous UFOs were spotted by local authorities, airline pilots, and civilians worldwide. 
By July, these sightings made headlines in newspapers all across the United States, culminating on the 8th of July with the alleged recovery of a crashed disc on a ranch near Roswell, New Mexico. The military were quick to respond. They send agents out all over this area here to try to get information on Roswell. And yet we stood back like fools and said it didn't exist. It was a weather balloon. Fifty years after the incident, Colonel Philip J. Corso, formerly a member of the National Security Council, revealed that the weather balloons over Roswell was a cover story for the crash of an alien craft. We had to cover to protect our own installation because they tabbed us as kooks and they destroyed our organization. You had to understand what was going on in the government and the climate of opinion, though. So, discretion by the part of Val, we just kept it to ourselves. Only some certain people know about it, head to head, brain to brain, no paper trail. Although the official position claimed that UFOs didn't exist, this secret memorandum written by General Nathan Twining suggests otherwise. The consensus expressed by the Air Materiel Command was that the phenomenon reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious. The memo continues. There are objects probably approximating the shape of a disk of such appreciable size as to appear to be as large as a man-made aircraft. In this chaotic climate, and in an effort to reorganize the U.S. military, President Truman passed the National Security Act. This act built the framework for America's modern national security structure. Among other things, the act established the National Security Council and the CIA. The National Security Act of 1947 allowed for the creation of a state within a state. Author of UFOs and the National Security State, Richard Dolan, asserts that the signing of the National Security Act created an intelligence infrastructure capable of maintaining a very high level of secrecy. One with an enormous amount of power, an enormous amount of wealth, an enormous amount of secrecy and latitude of action. The level of secrecy imposed by the U.S. government on the UFO issue is revealed in this top secret memorandum. It was written in 1950 by electronics engineer Wilbert Smith, a high-ranking official in the Canadian Department of Transport. After a meeting with a top government scientist employed by the Pentagon, Smith was informed that flying saucers exist, and more significantly, the matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rating higher even than the H-bomb. In my opinion, I think they were worried that it would panic the public if they knew that someone had vehicles that had this kind of performance way back right after World War II. On a clear night in February of 1951, Lieutenant Graham Bethune sat at the controls of a U.S. Navy transport plane en route from Iceland to America. The flight was routine until Bethune spotted a strange group of lights below his aircraft. And we were at 10,000 feet, and this was about 15 miles away. It came up to us like that, just about that fast. And of course, I disengaged the autopilot to put the nose over. I thought we'd be able to go under this thing and not collide with it. And one idea that's staring me in the face and you couldn't see anything out the cockpit. We could tell it was a monster about 300 feet in diameter. As it drifted out to our right, we could see the dome. According to Lieutenant Bethune, the object remained in this position for about a minute. It then accelerated rapidly and disappeared above the horizon. Upon landing at an air base in Newfoundland, he was debriefed and interrogated by several officers from naval intelligence. At the conclusion, he was ordered to never speak about this incident again. You accept anything like that simply because you're in the military and that's your job is defending the country and whatever they tell you to do, you do. The identity of the group responsible for imposing the secrecy around the UFO issue was revealed to Lieutenant Bethune several months later in a conversation with an officer from naval intelligence. And I asked him the question, what happens to this report? Where does it go? He said it goes to Navy Intelligence, Chief Naval Operations. Then it goes to a Joint Intelligence Committee. Now, of course, later on, I learned that it was MAJIC, which is Majority Agency of Joint.